thank you for joining me today on The Mighty Dragon. And today I have with me the director and the writer, I, actually I think you were both the writers, of a horror film, The Crumbs. That is Craig Ahrens and David Espinosa. Welcome to The Mighty Dragon. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for inviting us. And yeah. I, I've actually um, had Chelsea Yerkovitz on a few times um, on The Mighty Dragon and she was Victoria in The Crumbs. So I'm so glad to have you after speaking to her about the film. So anyway, let's kick off. Can you tell me a little bit about the story? And also with this horror, how did you make it unique? Because I found it quite unique horror and I, I never really do these days. So it was a, a pleasant surprise. I'll make it really easy. Uh, it's David's vision that granted um, I'm down as co-writer, but I am like barely hung, holding on to that part. But uh, the actors, uh, the crew, and myself, if you will, Victoria, uh, supported David's vision as that would be really for any feature film uh, on set. And in feature film, uh, there's one boss. And David and I collaborate, make no mistake, but uh, it'd be disingenuous for me to say, oh yeah, Craig, but I'm gonna have to defer that to David. It's easier for me that, um, because it's the truth. So there you go. So Mr. Espinosa. <laughs> well, how do I follow that? <laughs> Thank well, you, no, no, man. I mean, no, look, I'm not, I'm not being that. That's the truth, Victoria. Um, oh, what I do is no. I mean, I mean that because um, if, if David and I clash, if we're, if it's a, a battle of e, everybody suffers. Um, I'm, I'm very involved with pre-production, and, and David will share, you know, what that looks like, and post-production, and and um, engaging with all of our terrific support base. But when it comes to shot lists, um, uh, all, all, all of that pre-production planning, and certainly on set, um, that, that, that's David's genius. Well, he, look, he has 40 years experience in the business. So anyhow, go ahead, David. Well, <laughs> well back to your question. And thank you so much for that question. Uh, how we came about uh, developing this story. We had actually, we're working on another script and it was pretty far out and we kept kind of like thinking well is this really us is it is it carrying the messages we want to send out and we said no and <clears throat> i sat down one day and the name ironically this is what triggered it uh benjamin crumb dr benjamin crumb came to mind i don't know why and from <laughs> that it just like all these characters popped out and right. I started writing that. And so I would go back to Craig and say, hey, what do you think of this? You know, but, and write, put it forth and what I thought it was. And, and he goes, yeah, okay, this is kind of crazy. This is a little weird. And we wanted to create characters that were extremely outrageous, but that were also pretty much normal. Yeah. We wanted the same things that normal people want. They want love and respect and acceptance and understanding, forgiveness, all those things that humanity seeks in their lifetime, every human being. And so they're not much different. How we justify what we do, our actions, our morality, that seems to be dependent up to a large part on where you're at. Now, where you're at can be a space in time, could be a geographic location, could be a, a frame of reference in your own mind. So given that, we decided that we would write something that could reflect our current society, the pretty much a base selfishness as to what's important, who's important. Well, who's important is very well placed out in the film. If you have a reservation, you're important. If you don't, well, you're, you're obviously there to volunteer. <laughs> You're serving. <laughs> if you've seen the film, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> so, for the concept, is, as, far, as far as horror goes, for Craig and I, and I think I can speak for Craig on this issue, is not mm -hmm. about blood and guts. It's not about fright, some monster coming with a big butcher knife going to cut your head off. Yeah. 
uh, oh, all right, in certain circumstances, that that is valid, I suppose. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The disturbing part of that film is that it was based on real events. Yeah. And that bothers me. Mm. Why would I want to repeat that? I, I don't. I don't see that. So for us, it was more a matter of developing characters that out of the necessity to survive, they do what they have to, as all yeah. people do. I think when you see the title, The Crumbs, it sounds like a comedy. And then <laughs> when you put it on and watch it, it really isn't. <laughs> I, I found um, something quite interesting about it. Um, with indie horror, does it give you a bit more license to explore some of the darker scenes? Say, like the the murder. There was a murder of a child, and um, a potential rape scene. Can you explore those areas with indie horror more? Well, I don't know if indie horror is necessarily a mechanism to which triggers freedom, artistic freedom. I think what we're really looking at is who is the market. Where is the market and why is the market and what is acceptable and not acceptable? For me, yeah. gutting, a, 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 taking a young lady and stringing her up uh, on some type of wall and gutting her is the mm -hmm. most disgusting thing I could watch. Yeah. So yeah. if you noticed in the film, if you've seen the film and anybody yeah. does, those things you mentioned, you never saw. They were in your head. We suggested that this may occur and it was always prevented. And what did happen, you never really witnessed, you, you heard, yeah. you saw essence of. And the reason for that is very, very straightforward for, and I think I can speak on Craig's behalf on this issue. Uh, we're not into exploiting in that regard. We're more into where are your fears individually? What scares you? Yeah. You know, what frightens you? The Evil Down the Street, our first film we did, there's approximately about seven, eight drops of blood in the whole film. <laughs> and we've had great reviews on the film that, and then we've had some people say they didn't like it because it wasn't scary enough in that regard. Didn't have enough blood and guts. Right. And other okay. people said because of its sense of reality and truth, how, because it was based on something that really happened, how scary is that? So it's here. Yeah. Yeah, I, f I found that interesting. I really love the characters and I love the way that the film was about the family rather than the victim's experience within that environment. Really, for me, it felt like that. And I love Leonard. I thought he was like mm -hmm. a Bond villain type of character, you know, and I really like Dr. Benjamin. And um, I, I found that character really quite interesting. And then when you started hearing like the English accent, like the very posh English, English accent and the country hit accent. And then you could say, wow, they came from a really affluent background in the, in the UK. And then how's this happened? And it really did make your brain work as to what the background was behind these characters. I, I found that really interesting. I really enjoyed that part of the, part of the film for me was the characters. I thought they were great. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. The actors, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Hatch, Maria Olson, Chelsea Jerkowitz, Anton Clark, yeah. Robert Crow, uh, a whole list of all the other people who the day players who came in, everybody brought such a tremendous amount of talent and energy and skill to what we did. Uh, mm. Not just them, there were collateral yeah. characters. I don't know if you caught that guy creeping around in the bushes out there. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> that tall guy. <laughs> with yeah, who was who was that guy, right? <laughs> they, 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 they should have come off in the first few minutes. They would have been a lot better off. <laughs> I, I really love the police officer as well. I love the guy who played the police officer. I thought he was so good. He just felt so natural. And I, I just Robert Crowe? Yeah, I thought he was great. I loved he, it. He's, he's a fantastic actor, uh, a well-seasoned actor. Uh, I'd like to have... Yeah, you should interview him. As a matter of fact, I think he, him, Jeff Hatch, I think you'd love talking to both those gentlemen. Uh, we can arrange for that. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. I'd love to. And, and Robert Marie comes from Sun would be good too. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, when, when you originally came up with the concept, was it from the victim side or did you always feel it was going to be about the Crumb family? It was always about the family. Right. It was, 
yeah, it, it was how the family, the nucleus, how all families have that, and it extends outward from there, how they see the world, how the world, it's not about the world, they're their world. That family yeah. is the world, as is all of our families. We protect our children, our grandchildren, our brothers and sisters, uh, that nucleus right there, that's what's important. And, yeah. uh, you know, as Dr. Benjamin says, we'll do whatever we have to do to survive. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I felt very much like it was kind of like a ha Hammer House film. It could have e easily have slot into that type of, you know, feel. Um, was he, that your inspiration or what were your inspirations in horror? Well, uh, it's kind of strange because I never, I watched a lot of horror films in my time and, and I loved scaring myself, but I've never been like this really heavy duty, you know, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger. And I, I've never been really that into that kind of genre. So I always thought I was on the outskirts of it. Yeah. For me, writing is about what you're not saying or what you're not revealing. So when I write, I think about what's the most outrageous thing relative to our senses. And then I ask myself, can I present something that is so outrageous, but can be accepted under the circumstances? Can I get an audience to come away from this film and go, they were the most horrible, despicable people, but I really liked them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. I did find myself liking Dr. Benjamin. I thought he was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and like what David is saying, Victoria, is that, you know, they're in many regards, they're like any other family. They, they go through their needs, their wants, um maybe they have a few issues but their construct of a family yeah. remains the same and you know that's when you mentioned earlier about indie filmmaking and i think that's the beauty of what david and i do that david and i collaborate every day and it gives the the latitude of artistic freedom to do to do what we want to do we're not beholden to a studio we're not beholden necessarily to investors. We're very thankful and appreciative of our investors, but they're not breathing down our neck. They're not like saying, well, we can go this way, that, and that's important for David and myself because what we, we, we create along with the genius of other people, our actors and crew and everybody, everybody plays a big part of what we create. And the sum total of that is something much bigger than all of us that will outlive our existence on this planet. So there's something very right about filmmaking and, and what we create. And that's, you know, David's leadership, like I mentioned earlier on, but the end result is something that's bigger than all of us, bigger than the individual. I think that's great. I mean, it sounds like that there's a lot of pressure off of you um with, with your own thing and that you're doing but you're so committed to it as well that it just works perfectly you're kind of like living the dream aren't you yeah yeah that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good way to say it yeah sometimes feels like a nightmare <laughs> living the nightmare and the dream together <laughs> i'm like wait a minute and then it turns into a comedy and i end up with a documentary going what the hell was that <laughs> yeah do you and, write and if, do you write comedy I, as well do you write uh, comedy we, as well? We don't. We don't know yet, that. Victoria. We're, we're gonna. We're gonna find that out. We're shooting, and I'll say we're getting yes. ready. We have an experiment about to uh, come to uh, fruition here, uh, February eighth. We begin shooting a new comedy called Love and Quarantine. Right. Great. Or or so we're or, hoping that we write comedy and not a documentary. Yeah, <laughs> but we're totally prepared. If nobody's laughing, Victoria. We've just made our first documentary. So we don't know yet which way that, that door's opening. Great. Okay. Oh, actually, I was going to ask you, how has this year been for you with the pandemic and everything else? Has it stopped you really or kind of like, have you had to put it over till 2021 now? Or? Well, not really. It's kind of strange uniquely. And I think it's because of the way Craig and I initially 
got together and how we've developed the company. Uh, I met Craig a few years back, a friend of ours, a mutual friend called Chase, introduced me to Craig and uh, we hit it off right away, became friends and became uh, partners in crime. Uh, we decided yeah. we both uh, were driven on the same level, had the same passion. Uh, we understood the necessity to not have to ask each other, what are you doing? Uh, but rather to come to each other with, this is what I got going on. Right. And from that, uh, and here's how we did it. We did it over the telephone and the computer. We never met in person until the day before we were going to start shooting our first film. Really? We shot, yep, we shot yeah. the film. And then we didn't see each other again until we debuted the film at the Chinese theater in Los Angeles. Wow, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> and then we, we, by that time, we organized and already wrote our second film, The Crumbs, uh, which is out now. And we did it the same way. And yeah. that was shot in Placerville, California, here in Northern California, the Sacramento area, up in the gold uh, mining area. Okay. And then we got together again over the phone, and we did the same thing with another film called Demon Fighter, which uh, was shot just this past summer in the Fresno area, right in between with the pandemic going on. Yeah. Uh, because we were able to organize and we're so structured in that way, that we can set up everything we need to do without meeting each other physically or any other of the component people. And that wow. includes cast and crew. And we put it together and then we get everybody to meet at the same time at the same place. Bam! And we put it together. My training was in theater. I studied theater at UCLA and got a degree in directing and acting. And my whole background was in making certain that on a day certain at this specific hour the curtain will go up so i organized the same way a film so that on day one we know the curtains going up we know what scene we're shooting we know who's in it where we're at what's happening everybody's totally aware as craig said earlier i put together a shoot schedule then a pretty comprehensive shot list However, it's not written in stone. I get it out to the DP, our uh, director of photography, our gaffer, other people who need to see those things. And it's a guideline. It's the first day of shooting. Everybody knows exactly what we're doing. And we're shooting these in uh, 13 days, uh, oh, wow. 16 days, uh, and on schedule, on time. Yeah. So that, and, and, that and film on, will be coming on, out first quarter. And on right, right. budget too, David. Oh, and on budget. Absolutely right. We're always on budget, on time. And, and we have Demon Fighter coming out uh, first quarter next year when we start yeah. shooting this other film, the comedy, hopefully. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Love and Quarantine. The alleged comedy. <laughs> the alleged comedy. <laughs> Craig said something, and I would like him to talk about it. Uh, what, what makes this work isn't how much we're planning this way that's pre-production planning and then the production the shooting the post-production all the marketing all of that stuff and and craig picks up that and runs with that and i think that's something you should, you probably want to know about uh, so craig if you want to discuss that yeah and that, well i appreciate that but you know you play an equally big supportive role there obviously um the the film that david was first mentioning or uh, or covering is the film there over his left shoulder, the evil down the street. And right. you know what? Yeah, <laughs> don't lean too far. Um, <laughs> but I think what, what works really well for David and me, we live about, what, 500 miles apart? Something like that, maybe? Something like that. It, it's a long drive, I can tell you that. And um, <laughs> But what we do as filmmakers, and the beauty of what we do, that we can make feature films on our computers. Now we have great people that we work with, make make no mistake, and that's our editor, music composer, sound design, all of that, right? But we're able to take the rough cut, drop it into our editing software. And then David and I go to work on that, Victoria, and, and cut it and cut it and cut it until we get to the film that we desire. When I say we, that's yeah. you know other people as well, but we don't have a lot of moving parts within CRA Entertainment. It's it's largely David and myself going through it every day 
and we'll, we'll hear from other filmmakers like, thankfully they, they appreciate what we do, but for David and me, we're filmmakers. By that depiction, that's what we should be doing. And if we're not making films, then we're, we're, we're not really filming. Two old guys. But we're just, we're just two old guys running around with a camera, right? And said, okay, now this time, you think I can take a movie of me running through the forest? I'll do you, then we'll edit it and we have a film. Um, I say that kiddingly, of course. With, with the, after you get through post-production, which, which is vitally important because once you release your film, you don't release it sort of, but you don't release it. No, let's pull that back. That once it's out, it's out. And then um, it, it's, everybody has an opinion about art as David, David has done a really good job in training me to be disciplined in that area because <laughs> everybody will view something and maybe have a different thought. That's cool, that's cool. But with the marketing, when we shot Evil Down the Street, Right after we shot that, what, David, March of 18? March of 18? Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the next yeah. month, let's say April of 18, we were on at Victoria joining all of these paranormal and horror groups uh, before the film ever came out, which was May of last year. And the beauty of our support base, call it what you want, fan base, support base, or whatever, they are incredible. I mean, they are incredible. And we are members in, in around 850 various groups. It's these people that, that have opened their hearts, their to that David and I do, but it's bigger than that, that you get to know them, that they, they're part of what we do and, and we serve them. And, and I'm, I don't say that foolishly or, or serendipitously that, that I, I, I really mean it and for David, that it's fun what we because we do it for them you know um it's um so it's a relationship that without them there's no us there's no point to what we do so yeah that we engage 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 in, sh in social media um facebook instagram not twitter as much i think it's just i don't really quite get the whole twitter thing it's it's cool it has its place but David and I look. We're old school, you know. That we we struggle with the social media. It's easy for us. No, I'm not. I'm not joking here. It's easier for yeah. us, honest to God, to make. You can't keep films. up with it, can you? There's TikTok and everything else now. You well, just that, yes, yes. It, right? Well, but my kids have assured me, Victoria. I'm too old for TikToks. I and I'm and I'm not. I'm okay with that. I have no. I have no problem with that. But like Facebook, you know, like when it goes Facebook Live and things like this. It really, I'm speaking for me totally on this. It makes me really uh, uncomfortable. David's background is stage. Um, my background was feature films as an actor. And I like feature films. Like they'll say, cut, okay, well, let's do this or that. Anything live makes me really, it's like, really, we have to go live? I, I, it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. But again, specifically on the marketing part of things, it's uh, for us, it's Facebook, the groups, uh, Messenger, we engage, 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 and not because we feel obligated or say, oh, we have to, because because we, we need to do it to market our films. It's yeah. cool. We, we like, like your show today, we just mm -hmm. meet so many wonderful people. Um, and that's that's what makes it, what we do fun and enjoyable. Great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how you can reach out to the world now, isn't it? Oh, it should, this like is a perfect this. illustration. Perfect isn't illustration. Isn't it? Incredible. I must go ask something about the crumbs, uh, as I'm an English lady here, and I, I, I found I loved the some of the English swear words <laughs> in the film. <laughs> ah, right, <laughs> you've been doing some research here. Um, I, how challenging was it for the actors to switch in between their country accent to a very posh English accent? Uh, I didn't. Uh, these actors. Uh, one of the reasons they were cast was because of their ability to do that. Yeah. When I auditioned them, I told them that there will be times when it's just the family and your natural accent will emerge. Yeah. And then when strangers come on the property, you put off like you're American. So right. you change your accent like that. Yeah. That's how good they were. I was so impressed. Maria Olson 
just a fantastic actress, Jeff uh, Chelsea. Uh, yeah. Anton didn't have to do that for the obvious reason. He was mm -hmm. from here. Uh, yeah. We set that up that way. Uh, but they were, uh, a lot of people didn't get it. Many people did. I think folks like yourself who are from the UK, they get it. Yeah. You know, that, oh, these people originated over here, went over there. Because da, da, da. Yeah. I've had some people ask me, well, was it that, were they not being able to do it right? And I said, no, just know when they do it and when they don't do it and you'll get it. Right. I tell you, um, with the accents themselves, I didn't find them too over the top, which I thought was good because when I hear an American actor do an English accent, say like the, this RP accent, that it's really over the top and you can tell it's not natural. But with the, the film, when I watched the film the other night, I didn't feel that with any of the characters. I, I felt it was quite authentic. And when um, the mother said, Victoria, that sounded like my mum saying it. You know? So <laughs> well done guys on that. I, I honestly was very impressed with the accent. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed that about it. And I, I thought it really made me start thinking like, what's the background of these people, you know? Where did they come from? They were obviously very affluent here at some stage in the UK, and then they went over. What's their story? So I think for anyone English, they they probably their cogs were working a lot sooner than maybe some other audience, I guess. But I found that really, really quite interesting. I I, I really like that the flipping of accents there. I, I love accents anyway, but I love that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you was about lighting. And I watched a Kubrick, a Kubrick documentary the other day about how lighting was just essential to him and was his, you know, it, the way it was his component, you know, that was his style. How did you work this with the proms? Was lighting as important here or was the story or how, how does it work with lighting in, in the horror genre is what I'm trying well, to say. <laughs> well, well, lighting is important in, in every genre it's just more pronounced in the horror genre yeah. for emotional articulation. Right. It, it'll, it'll, it sets a tone immediately. As soon as we see a, a dark bluish gray sky with a moon rising, we know something's creepy going on. Right. So uh, you take that now and put somebody inside of a room and the curtain is a lace curtain and the same bluish kind of light is coming through now the window with the clouds creeping over the moon slightly, yeah. causing some shadow. All right, we know something's creepy going on. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, we had a great lighting gaff gaffer, uh, Mr. Matthew Tomocic, uh, he calls himself Ghost. Uh, he brought it, uh, he understood what we were looking for. We did uh, night shots and then, and then I gotta be honest, after that, after you get a good lighting guy who understands mood, then it goes into post-production and you have somebody doing colorization on the film, which further enhances that. So what we're looking to convey is mood, character, moment, you know, a love scene. That's it, that uh, we, same lighting I just told you, that wouldn't work for a love scene. That's yeah. too creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Was it Dracula? Was he gonna do Biter in the head? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But <laughs> so, but we can change up the light just a little bit, brighten it up a little bit, change the color tones to a little rosy hues, maybe, you know, and now we have a nice, soft, you know, passionate scene. So yeah. it's incredible. Uh, in The Evil Down the Street, our first film, which, by the way, Craig was the uh, principal writer in that film, the color, uh, the lighting was done by Mr. Dan Watt. And the emotional qualities to the scenes were just incredible. He also did the lighting for the upcoming film, Demon Fighter. Uh, I think uh, your question, uh, is, it's like sound. People ask, how important is music? Oh my gosh, without music, you don't know the cavalry's coming. Yeah. You hear, you hear that first, right? Yeah. And then, then you hear the horses running and you turn and here they are. Boom. Yeah. Without yeah. music, Dracula coming down the stairs is just some old guy coming down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I read, I, I mentioned this a few times on my podcast. I read the other day that the uh, shower scene in Psycho was originally going to be silent. Yes. <laughs> Can you imagine that? 
<laughs> yes. It wouldn't work. And he did, you wouldn't believe the amount of time and days, hours they spent to get that one scene. Yeah. Incredible. Funny you bring up Hitchcock because he is one of my favorite directors. I love a lot of them. Kubrick, you brought him up, etc. Yeah. Scorsese, all these great directors that are out there. But Hitchcock had a way of doing things that you ask yourself, how did he do that? You know, right. there wasn't the high tech things going, the computer, all that, the, you know, the CGI and whatnot. And Craig could tell you how complex that stuff is. He's, this is my minutia man on the, uh, when we're editing something, <laughs> he'll, he'll call me and he goes, you know, I, I like that scene, but there's something, there's something that's not right. And I go, well, what is it? And he'll say, well, you got to go right here. I go right there. And he goes, did you see that? I go, what? He goes, watch, I'll show you again. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but if, 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 you know if, what? Then I catch it, and I go, "Oh, oh, yeah!" And he goes, "All right, there it is. We're closing, for example, a scene on when somebody got their eyes closing. Boom! And just a moment to catch it. He catches it, and he says, "Back it up, cut that tenth out." And now we got her with her eyes open when they cut the scene. Well, well, so if, if, if I if I may, and, and I, I. Uh, um, I'm, I'm proud, I guess maybe proud of the fact that with our trailers, both um, the regular trailer and the sizzle trailer at Victoria, David and I cut those ourselves and then we will send it on to our editor. Um, now I'm not suggesting that our trailers are all that whatsoever, but we will agonize over a tenth of a second, cut in on eyes open, eyes closed. I mean, that's rule number one in editing. You never, um, cut on eyes closed, obviously. But um, David and I, our philosophy, if you will, and I'm not saying we, we accomplish this, but our goal is, so long as the film looks good, kind of addresses your issue on lighting, looks good, sounds good, good acting and good story. Um, if you have that going for you in any film, feature films in particular, of course, somebody's gonna spend their hard earned money and watch your film. Now, again, I'm not saying that we do any one of those, but that's, that, that is the goal going into it. It is the goal. Um, and then post-production, and David is right, Victoria, I will, I will agonize over it. And I get really excited. We get, well, I get excited, and I get like this knot on my stomach when we get the rough cut. <laughs> it's like, oh, my gosh, David, you know, we, no more films. We suck. We totally <laughs> suck. And it's like, okay, Craig, go have a beer. Call me later on. But... Then we'll just start, you know, taking this big blob of clay and shaping it and shaping it and shaping it and shaping it. And like people down the street and the same with the crumbs that, you know, we will, we will put scenes, we will, we will, we will start shifting things around. Um, and David and I will get some opinions from people like saying, okay, this, this is where we are and, and maybe have like a real uh, limited screening on the film because just because David and I maybe are the two guys in the room, if you will, you know, we're not so silly. So, oh, we're also the smartest guys. What a coincidence. So, you know, we will, we will seek um, opinions from others. And as we all know, people are not short of their, their opinions, oh, gotcha. but, but, but we, ha <laughs> but, but we have to be, you know, we're smart. Well, I, I, you know, we're selective as far as how that goes, because we want people to be real with us. We don't want people to say, well, I thought your guys' film sucked, but I don't know how to tell you. Well, tell us our film suck. It's better you tell us in the rough cut than later on, right? But um, <laughs> we do spend a lot of, yeah. David and I spend a lot of time. David's background is also in music. And so he's really good in that area. Um, I'm, I'm good from the standpoint of saying, I think that really sucks. But we will, you know, we will splice in um, sound uh, music and all of that. And it's fun. It's like you said earlier. Victoria, it's really fun that you take this and shape it and shape it and shape it, and then out it goes. But um, yeah, we spend a, a lot of time post production. Um, okay. You know, I like to think time well spent too. And uh, just going back to the music, when you're saying about how vital it is at certain points, when would silence be vital in a film? That's an interesting question mm -hmm. because it, uh, often I have silence in films. OK, uh, there's I have moments like that in the crumbs where there is no music, where there is nothing, because the moment itself creates the mood. 
immediately. The actors, the exchange between the characters creates the tempo and the mood right away. So there's no guessing. I don't need a prelude. It's kind of like, you know, when you watch a movie and somebody's in the woods and all of a sudden you hear, and you know something's coming. Well, some things you don't need that. For example, same thing when you see somebody in the woods, a young lady walking in the woods, and then she stops. And then we take a shot of her feet and she steps and we hear a snapping of the, of the tree limbs and she stops again. Well, that right there starts to set tempo too and mood without yeah. using music. So right. depending upon you know what the point is, and that's, I think, an artistic choice at times. Uh, for me, I, uh, I, I love acting. It's what I set out to be. Yeah, it's what my training was. Uh, and I developed it into a, a director because I, I just gravitated towards it. Uh, and uh, I taught myself film directing by watching films and just realizing I'm looking through the camera and asking why. That, that question each time, why this yeah. angle, why there, why tracking, why racking, why whatever you're doing, why? And you start to understand, you start to see what it is. Uh, so for, for me, the silence, oh yeah, you watch the mother and, and her baby's just been born and, and she's holding that baby and the baby's eyes open and you see the mom and then the baby has a little smile. Oh, yeah, that needs no music. No, you're right. Yeah, that's so interesting. Where you feel that music makes something and it doesn't really sometimes, does it? No. It's more powerful no. sometimes not to have it. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a, a thought I had while I was watching the film it was like, wow, this would make a great TV show, uh, and like a series. Would you consider making the crumbs into a series? Well, they're, we've they're talked about that, Craig and I, and it's really, we're, that's really not our choice. That is our audience's choice. If our audience was to demand that they would like to see more of it, well, God humble is, I, I would be like overwhelmed as I know Craig would be. And, and we would consider whatever, you know, because as Craig said earlier, he was talking about the relationship. Uh, being symbiotic to that degree yeah. so true without you the viewer we the filmmaker have no purpose simple as that uh, and for us uh, we're just humbled that anybody wants to see any of our movies <laughs> right right <laughs> I, honestly I, I thought that it would be great I, I love the story of the biker I thought that was a really cool component to it I just like you know would love more of that you know you could do one per show really couldn't you and yeah you, I thought, you wow could... this would be great tv series do you remember the fugitive this is an old television story yeah. okay series all right well each series each episode was based upon him doing some kind of good and almost getting caught and he and the guy chasing him well how easy is it to set up a detective looking for missing people and coming upon these people so yeah you know we've we've thought about this but again it's not something that craig and i sit down and say all right we're going to do a tv series yeah we're going to we're going to keep doing what we're doing we have a mission uh that we're working on uh we believe strongly in a purpose to say certain things and i think our my goal originally and i, I think i can speak for craig uh we want to shake people up a little bit and get them thinking about things yeah. So we write about issues. We don't make judgments about issues. I'm not a didactic writer. I, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not going to preach at you. I'm going to present as we will, we will present issues and topics and see what you do with it. <laughs> yeah. I, right. I just wanted to finish off by saying um, that there was a few scenes that I'll never forget that have stayed with me. And I felt very, very powerful scenes um, in the crumbs. I, I I, I've watched so much horror over the last few weeks leading up to Halloween and I felt like a couple of the scenes in your film would just will stay with me over the other horror films that I've watched. Oh wow, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. got you know I'm sitting here going, 
What scene? Don't ask, Dave. I Don't can't. Ask. I, will it, um, it will be too much of a spoiler, won't it? If okay. No, no that's why I said. Don't ask. Don't ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but really cool. honestly, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today on a very special day in the U.S. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I wasn't gonna go there, but thank you, yeah. Joe Biden and Harris. Woo yeah. Woo and, was and, I? And, I can't believe it. <laughs> but uh, congratulations. Yeah. Democracy at work. Hoo, 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 hoo. That's right. That's right. Look, the orange is setting in the background. You see? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much, David and Craig. And I hope to thank catch you. up with you on here again, maybe next year after the next one's out. So beautiful. Great. Catch up with you so soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me on the Mighty Dragon podcast. Come back soon.